Okay. Welcome everybody to the UX group conversation. It is September 21st, 2021, and we are recording. So let's get started. Let me check the agenda. I don't see any questions yet. So let me just pause and wait and see what folks would like to discuss. Everyone on my team knows I'm happy to stare at you. I'll just stare and stare. Somebody's got to have a question. That's why you're here. I think people are still going through the uh, slides. Doesn't even have to be a question about the slides. It can be about anything. Hi, Christine. <laughs> My name is Jessica Brown. Um, so uh, I'm one of the managers in the revenue team, and this is my first time here. Uh, I haven't seen the slides yet, <laughs> but um, I kind of wanted to come to the meeting to familiarize myself um, with this particular group. Um, and it's my first time. So maybe if you can kind of like um, give a little background of the group, that would be awesome. Sure, welcome, Jessica. Thanks so, so much. Yeah, uh, thank you for asking your question. So user experience at GitLab is inclusive of product design, user research, and technical writing. Within that product design bucket, we also have our foundations team, which focuses on our design system, which are a single source of truth components that we use in our product. Um, our responsibility is to create exceptional experiences for our end users to really understand the problems that they have and what they need and help solve those problems in the best ways possible while at the same time iterating um, and making you know, the, the, the smallest yet still valuable changes we can. Um, we partner very closely with our product managers, and we are part of the engineering department. Does that give you a start? Anything you want to ask based on that? That's awesome, and thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. New. Yes. Thank you for the prep on the UX group conversation as always. And I noticed Cynthia's comment and maybe I should have attended the UX research GC and asked this question, but uh, what should the mix selection be for when we are trying to figure out a broad uh, survey, which reflects our customer base and mix in terms of new versus experienced users? Yeah, that's a great question, Anoop, and it's timely because we're starting to see the impact of exactly that question. I'm going to turn it over to Adam because he is much more of an expert here than I am. Yeah, great question, Anoop. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, there was a key review not too long ago where Sid asked 
a question that made us think about this a little more. And we started to reach out to the data team to find out what our percentage of experienced users and new users are. And we, we have those numbers and it's not 50-50, which is what we've been sampling for, for SUS. And the reason why we've been doing that up to this point is to meet that, uh, that lower margin of error, which is fairly common within SUS across the industries. So this quarter, we're going to be uh, experimenting a little bit and trying to alter those experience versus new percentages for SUS to match our own user base that way. So I hope that answers your, your question. Yes, thank you. Yeah, always happy to talk about SUS and just really like to explore iterations on it too. Yeah, thank you, Adam. You're always so open to feedback and, and have fun, creative ideas about things. Um, cool, okay, Cynthia. Yeah, so it's it's kind of nice that I put this after Anoop's question because it's sort of related because I know that one of the main findings out of the UX research was that learnability was having a big impact on SAS and general uh, view of the UX. So I was kind of wondering, I noticed that one of the OKRs is around improving learnability. And I'm wondering what is the like primary or ways that you are measuring that learnability and whether it's improving? Are you just using uh, SAS or, or are there other ways that you're kind of measuring that in terms of what um, the designers are working on. Yeah, and it's I'll say it's not just designers. So we have folks working across on this across the entire UX department. Uh, learnability is a key theme for us. Um, the interesting thing, so it, it, we certainly go beyond SUS. SUS tells us what's happening, doesn't tell us why it's happening. So once we understand what's happening, now we're digging into that. Okay, well, why? Um, so I actually want to have um, each of my leaders uh, address this. We'll start with Adam talking about user research we're doing on learnability. I would like to move then to Valerie and have her talk about the KR we have for product designers around learnability. Then we'll transition to Susan. She can talk a little bit about learnability in docs. And then finally, we'll transition over to Tori, although I think that'll actually transition into Kiana's question right after that. So maybe actually it's Tori, we'll save you. We'll, we'll let you respond to Hayana instead. All right, Adam. Thanks, I lost track of the order of people there. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'll first say that uh, how we're measuring learnability. Uh, one of the ways within SUS or system usability scale, um, thank you, Bronwyn, for asking that question. So um, it's, it's a scale that has 10 questions in there. And question 10 is a big one around how we measure learnability. So uh, after I'm done talking, I'll post a link to all the questions. So there's a little bit more context in there. I believe question seven and three are also related to learnability as well. So I'll, I'll post that. But to uh, talk a little bit more about what Christy was alluding to around some of the work we're doing from a research perspective around learnability this quarter, we're learning a little bit more about how our users learn GitLab. Um, and we're approaching it from two different ways. One, we're talking to people who are GitLab users. They've been using it for at least a year. Um, and we're interviewing them to find out how their learning experience went. So thinking back to when you started learning, what kind of hurdles, what kind of challenges, what helped, what didn't. And the other approach is we're, we're actually finding brand new users and we're right there with them in their learning experience for about two months. So that part is really interesting. Uh, I'm handling that one personally, and it's it's just fascinating to to be alongside people as they're learning and to check in with them every couple of weeks 
And uh, at the end of that, we'll find out a little bit more about what's effective for people in terms of learning approaches and why, and what's not that effective also, and how they learn in the context of they still have to do their jobs too. So there's lots of interesting things we'll find out there. Uh, I'll hand it over, I think Valerie's next. Yeah, Okay. Valerie. Great. Yeah, thank you, Adam. So one of the things that we're doing is asking designers to do a UX scorecard. And I linked the UX scorecard handbook page if you're not familiar with that. Basically what it is, is that we evaluate a job within our tool. Um, so how does someone attempt to complete something within our own tooling? Um, and we've asked, we've done a little twist of this. So we've asked designers to do this for an area that they're less familiar with in our product. So this kind of leans into that learnability aspect of maybe a first time user or user who's um, you know, brand new, not necessarily brand new to GitLab, but brand new to using a particular feature or feature set within GitLab. Uh, so that's kind of the angle that we took from a product design standpoint is just getting somebody that didn't really know how to do something in the tool. What was their experience like? They document it and then they work together with the designer who actually works in that particular area on coming up with some recommendations for how to improve the experience. So usually every time we look at an experience within our tool, there's one or two things that surface that we think we could do a little bit better. And so we'll work on those recommendations and start bringing in uh, product management and our development partners on how we can actually solve for those things and get those prioritized and into our product. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, before we move to Susan, who will be next, uh, Anouk has, I think, a follow on comment slash question. Yeah, first of all, thanks, Valerie. I love the scorecards. I watch them and I have, you know, sometimes found myself scum when we, when I see some usability issues that we ship the product with. So I appreciate we doing that because it just brings it front and center for everybody and motivates people to make the change. Um, I had a question on learnability signal. So it's there, we know, but uh, have we amplified the learnability signal due to our sampling bias of 50, 50 new experience mix? And if so, by how much? And to ask another way, the real question I have is, are we missing on sort of some high signal from our experienced users because we are so overweight on the new users? I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Adam. Um, what I'll say is, Learnability is not just a problem for our new users, it's a problem for our experienced users too, for a few different reasons. So one, even when someone's been using GitLab for a long time, they aren't using necessarily every single feature, right? So as we introduce new features or as they explore new features, they are a new user there and they talk about learnability problems in those areas. Uh, learnability also impacts experienced users because they have to onboard new users as they join their company. And we hear about that. They make comments about that in verbatims in SUS. And the last thing that I'll mention is that um, the cohort mix has not seemed to have a big impact on whether or not learnability is a key theme for us because uh, we've, we've had different mixes there. But Adam, please follow on. Yeah, you're spot on, Christy. Uh, just if we were to just go one click in there, uh, and I'll share a link to this, um, but for question 10, Anoop, for Q2 that you just wrapped up, um, we're able to actually look at those two cohorts, and it was 57.8 uh, for new users and 62.6. Um, so Statistically, it is a bit of a difference there. It's small, but I, I don't know if it's dramatically weighing things towards new versus experience there because the overall score there was 60.4 for that question. So um, like I mentioned earlier, very uh, closely related to your earlier question, we will be looking to offset that 50-50 balance. Thank you, Adam. Anoop, does that answer your question? Yes, and, and I think the 
Thank you for bringing up that an experienced user is also a new user in other areas, especially for us as a single application, we keep introducing stages into other experiences. So it's important for us to remember that. Yeah, that's right. All right, Susan, talk to us about the importance of learnability and documentation. Sure, so for the doc site, we focus on facets of learnability. We look at readability, we look at findability, and organization of topics. So at a very atomic level, we test for the readability of our docs. There are ways to test to see how readable a page is. Um, and we run those tests. The most, I guess the most obvious way of measuring readability is how long are your sentences? If your sentences are longer than 25 words, you need to work on them. Findability is a really big problem for the doc site. The doc site is very large. And right now our search is not great. And we've recently been improving the organization of topics. Findability has to do with whether a person recognizes whether the information that they're looking for is what they're looking at. We talk about organization in concepts, tasks, references, and troubleshooting chunks of information. And we're working on that. When you chunk information in that way, it makes it more findable, makes it more readable, makes it more understandable. And I would assume learnable because of all of those different aspects. Yes, and documentation is a key way that users learn about our product. Um, so yes. that's why we're so focused on, on making these improvements. Okay, Hayana, take us home on this concept with your question <laughs> to Tori. Yes, uh, I was looking at the slides and I was curious to hear um, if you already have insights on the learnability challenges or opportunities for the empty states across the product, specifically that KR that the foundation's team has. Sorry. Yeah, thanks, Ayana. Um, so far, we've gathered examples across the product um, in order to map them to the use cases that we currently have defined in pajamas and determine if there are any use cases that we don't already have documented there. Um, so from there, we're looking at how the design may change based off those use cases. Right now in pajamas, the region is just one design. It has an illustration, some text, and some action buttons. Uh, one of the main use cases for empty states is for when a feature hasn't been configured yet. And we, one of the opportunities that we see is being able to provide more in-app guidance during those situations. So for example, we recently changed, I think it was the pipelines page to be from our normal empty state to showcasing like adding a CI CD template so that you can use that feature. So we wanna incorporate some of those ideas into our documentation to make empty states more flexible in order to help with some of that learnability of the features. Um, Jarek, I see you're on the call. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that or not. He's leading yeah. some of this work. Yeah, sure. So the other example you added was something that was, um, we were pinged on an issue around epics that are created that have no issues or related epics attached to them yet. And so I think there's an opportunity for us to be a little bit more creative and go beyond, like you mentioned, the illustration, some text and a button that links to documentation so for that example, we can potentially suggest related issues or epics that match keywords to that epic so that instead of having to do this manually, finding issues, adding them, um, we can do this intelligently. So those are just a couple examples where we're trying to think beyond our static informational empty states. And the, those are a couple of things that have come up so far during the IKR. Thanks for asking. Anoop, I think you're next. Yes, thank you. So my, my 
One of the product principles we have is you're not the customer, and this encourages PMs to go seek our primary feedback even when they have conviction on what the customer may want or doesn't. And as we're doing a lot of these learnability initiatives, I see uh, designers from other groups looking at the product from another designer. And that's great because it gives a different perspective. Uh, at the same time, we need to make sure that, uh, that to keep the user persona front and center when assessing whether something is difficult or whether this sort uh, order is better than the other sort order and things like that. And, um, and as a PM or a designer, we think something may be difficult, but it may not be for that persona because this is sort of their daily work. So how do we, how do we, how do designers sort of watch for that bias and correct for it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as a user experience department, obviously we always want to think user first, and we always try to remember that we are not our end users. Um, so. Yes, we are doing heuristic reviews, but that is one initiative amongst many to understand learnability. Um, so you heard Adam talk about the direct interactions that we're having with users in research, um, because that's a really important perspective for us. In the heuristic reviews, we rely on our expertise as UX practitioners to kind of go through and take that first pass at, hey, if I'm looking at this job, like does, does it on its face make sense? And it can be a really good way to do two things. One is uncover low hanging fruit. We've got low hanging fruit usability problems in our product that you don't have to be an expert in one of our personas to be able to look at it and just go, ah, just from a general usability perspective, this doesn't make sense. And so we're trying to uncover some of those things. The other thing that happens during a heuristic review is you see opportunities for further user research where you go, ah, I'm, this may not make sense. It's not making sense to me. Maybe it does make sense to the persona we're targeting. Ah, let's go dig in. Part of that digging in could be talking to the PM who may have a better understanding. It could be talking to internal personas. It could be going out and actually conducting additional user research. Um, Valerie, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that's great. Um... We do a ton of usability testing as well. So this is likely not the first time that we're also looking at the experience. If you look at the entire product development flow, um, we have many opportunities for validation. And so kind of to Christy's point, I, I think we're, we're doing a really good job at making sure that we are getting the user's voice and in, in perspective in anything that we do. Um, and then we always work on a level of confidence uh, so that's something that we take into consideration too. So it could be, I don't know, we'll, we'll find out towards the end of this quarter, but it could be that some of the information that we're getting from the heuristics kind of stands out to us. And we do say we have more questions about this, or we do need to get validation from our actual users. And then we will, that will be the next step for that. So um, most of the recommendations that will come out of this, there will be that question of, is this, does this really you know, how confident are we about this particular thing? Should we be moving forward with it? And it will likely trigger some additional research with the actual users. We also do category and maturity scorecards, which is another form of validation, it has a different purpose, but there's all of these ways that we're introducing the user to make sure that, you know, we have a high level of confidence in whichever direction that we're moving forward. Yeah, thank you, Valerie. Anup, does that help? Thank you, appreciate it. Hi, Bronwyn. I think mine was answered. <laughs> I was, I'm still new to GitLab and learning. So I was just curious to understand what that actually stood for. So thank you, Adam, for explaining that. Appreciate the notes. Awesome. Blair, did you want to add your question? My question uh, was actually answered uh, and I'm reading about it further now. Cool, I'll, I'll verbalize it in case anyone is watching this on the internet. Um, so what Blair asked was, have we considered other frameworks like UM, UX Lite and Pedro? I think you and Adam both answered that. So Pedro, you can start. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, basically we already use the UM, UX Lite, a variation of it when doing uh, the category maturity scorecards. Um, 
it's one of the questions that we use there. If you're not familiar with those types of scorecards, uh, take a look because they're different from uh, our UX scorecards that we talked before. And um, and yeah, that's one of the uses that we do for the UM UX Lite. Uh, Adam adds some context about uh, the why and how that relates to SUS. Uh, Adam, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for bringing up the category maturity scorecard. I I forgot about that. <laughs> so uh, yes, for UM UX Lite, it is faster. It's way faster. Um, we don't really have a huge problem with that being a big issue because we are able to get a pretty large N for our SUS surveys. Um, but I think the big thing around why SUS and not UM UX Lite at the moment is because of the level of granularity that SUS gives us with those 10 questions. Like we're able to really go in to help diagnose like what's bringing us down, which of these questions. And a great example of that is what we're finding with learnability at the moment. So awesome question though, Blair. Yeah, great question, great answers. Okay, we do have um, one additional question. I'm gonna stop the recording though because it's something that's protected by our safe framework. So let me do that. <laughs> 